Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's NOCO webinar, the overview of operations, benefit cost analysis, and the demonstration of the FHWA tool for the operations benefit cost analysis. My name is Nilu Parvin Ashtiani, and I will help facilitate today's webinar. Today's webinar is hosted by the National Operations Center of Excellence, or NOCO. So if you don't know already, at NOCO, we offer a variety of resources for the transportation systems management and operations or TISMOL community. Um, there are a few ways you can connect to us. Uh, first and foremost is our website. So if you look at your screen right now, on the bottom left side of the screen, there's the useful links. And the first one is the Knowledge Center. So there are thousands of uh, different resources related to TIS1 operations there. So feel free to browse that one. Also, um, if you want to access our webinar recordings as they come available, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. And you'll uh, get notified with the new webinar recordings. For more frequent and lively uh, announcements, you can subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter and also our Twitter account. Um, so uh, let me cover a few logistics before I hand it over to Jim Hunt uh, from FHWA, who will cover the agenda and the webinar outline for today. Uh, as I mentioned, this webinar is recorded, uh, and the video of the recording, along with all the presentations, uh, will be shared with you in, uh, in a follow-up email and also through our website. Uh, but in addition to that, you can directly download the, today's presentation here from the download slides uh, slash resources pod. This is available now and then at the end during Q&A. Um, so all the lines are muted by default, but uh, we ask you to uh, insert your questions in the question discussion pod that you can see on the right side of the screen. Uh, so feel free to add those questions as they come to your mind during the presentation. Uh, at the end, uh, during the last 30 minutes of the webinar, we will cover those Q&A. So every question will be uh, read out loud, and then uh, the presenters and panelists would answer that. If possible, please uh, just uh, make sure you know what, who are you asking the question from. If it's directed at a certain person, please include that in the question, too. Um, so that is um, all I have, uh, and I, with that, I would like to hand it over to Jim to start us off with the webinar. Jim? Okay. Thank you so much, Nilu, and uh, thanks to the Center of Excellence for their terrific partnership with Federal Highway Administration, helping us um, you know, get the word out on some of these latest developments in our, in our programs and things that we think uh, examples from other states that we can share as well. So uh, I'm going to, to um, kind of set the stage a little bit, give you a, a little background, high-level overview of um, operations, benefit cost analysis, and how it fits into the national, you know, some national programs related to operations, and what, what were some of our motivations, um, you know, for getting into getting into these areas. Uh, so we'll introduce BCA concepts and tools, I'll kind of kick that off and then I'll turn it over to um, Mike Lawrence to, to go into more detail on that. Um, we're also going to discuss some of the different applications for benefit cost analysis, you know, different parts of the process where it could be uh, a useful tool. Uh, we're going to spend a little time uh, just introducing our, our benefit cost spreadsheet tools, our sketch level benefit cost tool called TOPS BC. Uh, we've got a version that's been up on our website for a while and we've just um, Currently working on some some enhancements to that that, that Michael will, will demo a little bit, and then we've got a couple of present presentations from states to um, kind of illustrate the application of BCA in, in different contexts. So uh, this is a, a little more information about what I just said. Um, so Mike Lawrence is our is a subcontractor to Federal Highway under the 
prime contractor of Lidos, who's done a lot of work for us uh, with the materials I'll go over. Um, so the two presenters, we're pleased to have um, Stephanie Palmer from, from Michigan DOT and Matt Hansen from Caltrans. And I think what's going to be uh, insightful there is just to, we'll talk about, uh, you know, structuring a benefit-cost analysis and, and um, you know, making sure that costs and, and benefits and impacts are all accounted for properly. And you'll see two different um, illustrations of that here. In, in the case of 23, that's a kind of an active traffic management freeway management project. And in the case of the Caltrans example, it's, um, it's on a, a truck parking application. And that's um, still, still being worked on, but at least you'll be able to see you know, some of the things they're trying to accomplish and then think through how those, how those uh, impacts could be put into a VCA. Uh, so the team consists of various folks from Federal Highway, prime contract Lido, subcontractor um, Jack Fawcett. And uh, you know, I just mentioned uh, that you know when we did the Q and A, we might have some some support from Ralph Volpe and Tom Carney from um, FHWA Resource Center, who have been tremendous uh, assets to to us as well. So I'm with the again with the Federal Highway Office of Operations. I, I work on our organizing and planning for operations team, and one element of what we try and and try and support are improve, improved enhancing the ability of agencies to institutionalize operations into a traditional you know, road and bridge culture. And certainly um, supporting the business case, we think you know, benefit costs is, is right, right up the alley to help do that. You know, we, we looked at some of our programs that required some of our grant programs and special funded type programs that required, if you remember back the old um, ITS deployment projects, they all required a, an evaluation. And so often, these, the results of these evaluations showed you know, tremendous uh, benefit-cost ratios like out of the realm of what normally you see on a typical highway construction project, where you might see 1.1, you know, 1.2 .1, to 1. You know, some of these operational strategies, for example, you know, areas like traffic incident management, traffic signal improvements, ramp metering, um, you know, you're getting 10 to 1, 100 to 1. So, you know, we need to uh, get, get, get some tools out there to help uh, practitioners make the, make the business case uh, for investing in these types of strategies. So the next few slides are a kind of uh, background on TISMO, Transportation Systems Management and Operations, and um, oftentimes, you know, we're talking to planners and um, ex executives at different agents, you know, state DOTs that you just, just may need a little, little background. But, I know this audience is largely comes from this, this world, so we're not going to spend a lot of time going over this, except you know, I think it's instructive to highlight as you read through some of these definitions and some of the strategies, you start to get a glimpse of how structuring a BCA is a little bit different for, um, for operations. So an example here, you know, there's, there's comments or there's language about uh, multimodal cross-jurisdictional systems, services. Projects. So it's not just a project. It's about you know the the service. It's about the data. It's about agreements that might be in place with agencies, interoperability, and then if you look at the some of the performance measures, you know it's reliability, it's safety, customer service. You know some of these we are um, you know like safety and delay. We've been able to quantify fairly well for a long time. Reliability. We're just starting to be able to do that a little better. And customer service. I'm not. I'm not really sure we were there yet. So, you know, in terms of putting that into a, um, a monetized uh, framework. So it just gives you some sense of the, um, the nuances and the challenges and, the, and, 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 and some of the considerations for evaluating BCA when it comes to operations. Similarly here, what do we do with, with, our, with our strategies? We attempt to influence and change, modify travel demand. So, you know, where, when, and how much um, travel is taking place. Now, Again, if we're redistributing the same traffic in a more efficient way, um, are we capturing those benefits uh, appropriately across the whole system? Um, so, you know, this is just some of the some of the complexities and some of the things that we've been thinking about. You know, you, many of you, most of you, have probably seen the congestion pie, the relative breakdown uh, or breakdown in terms of the pie chart of, con of uh, contributors to to congestion. And a big 
more than 50% oftentimes is non-recurring events. So, you know, it, it, it begs the question is, do our, are our tools able to um, account for those, for, for the benefits of our operational treatments? So if we have treatments that and strategies that improve, uh, you know, incident response time, are, are our tools capable of capturing that benefit? Um, and then are we also able to capture how often there is bad weather or there are work zones and incidents? So it's kind of a two, two sides of the coin there that we're missing in a tr traditional uh, highway analysis, I would say. So, you know, it, one of the things that one of the uh, results that this leads us to is to thinking about doing BCA for operations using different scenarios. So we might look at different incident scenarios and different um, work zone scenarios and trying to uh, aggregate those to get a full picture of the overall um, overall benefit. And that, that was kind of the methodology used when we evaluated the integrated car to management um, uh, applications. Uh, again, the broad range of strategies we're trying to capture. So in TOPS BC, although it's, you know, we've got, we've got tools that are very specific in some of these areas. Um, our approach with a sketch tool is to try and, try and address as many of these at a more of a higher level. Uh, so I think, I think Michael could give you more detail on just, you know, which are included, which are not at this point. Um, but a fair amount of these can be modeled in, in our uh, spreadsheet tool. Um, and then again, we've got we've got a freight and we've got active traffic management are on here, and those are two of the examples we'll, we'll get into a little bit later. So what is BCA? You know, just at the basic level, it's uh, it's you know every decision we make, we make because we're trying to get benefit from it, and try and hopefully uh, <laughs> uh, get get enough benefit that it offsets whatever it, it costs us in in time and and money and other um, other types of costs. So um, you know that's. Basically, what we're trying to do, and with with Tops BC, I mean, one of the main uh, catalysts that it helps us helps us with is to is to structure and organize the framework for what you put on the left side of that equation, what you put on the right side of the equation, um, what it can be used for. You know, we're looking to assist agencies in prioritizing investments, um, justifying investments. Oftentimes. You know, we have now more data that's available that we can come go back and, and do a before and after study. And if you can convert that into a monetized BCA, it's a pretty persuasive case in, in many cases. Um, the middle bullet there is also very important that now when you use BCA, you have an ability to evaluate uh, benefits across different types of projects. I, I always remember the example someone when I just was starting out here is that how, you know, how would you compare uh, performance measures such as the cost per new rider, which was often the um, kind of the transit performance measure with level of service, which was a highway performance measure. Or you might have um, delay or throughput on a traffic signal um, performance measure. How can you, you know, compare those across? You've got cer a certain amount of funding. Well, benefit cost analysis normalizes that, equalizes that uh, by putting everything in a monetary, uh, monetary basis. Just put this up in that, uh, you know, we, we have these performance management uh, uh, requirements now. They were a big push between the last two uh, federal transportation legislations. And, and again, you know, we do see lots of uh, uh, synergy between benefit costs and, and what we're trying to achieve here nationally. Certainly the last bullet uh, focused on the effectiveness of the investment. But even things like asset management, where we're taking a closer look at how well our infrastructure is being maintained and how often it needs to be replaced to optimize, you know, to reduce the cost. Well, that's information that's also uh, pertinent to a BCA. So there are, there are quite a number of, um, of uh, connections here. The progress toward achieving performance targets. And I've always wondered how do agencies evaluate, so you have to meet or, or uh, the goal is to meet certain targets in all these different areas and in bridge uh, condition, pavement condition, safety and reliability and congestion. Again, it's difficult to do when you have so many different types of measures associated with these, these different functional areas. So if you can uh, quantify that and monetize it into a BCA type of a realm, then um, it makes those cross funding decisions a little bit a little bit easier to uh, to make. Um, 
just a few things here on what we have available. We have the, you know, for, for a number of years now, the ITS, the U.S. Department of Transportation Joint Program Office, has maintained the benefit cost, lessons learned, um, database. There's a, um, an update to that. I think there's a 29, or, or, or no, we have the 2018 right here, so it's the latest. Um, so anyway, that's one source, just going back and seeing Again, a lot of these were from those grant applications I mentioned earlier, and just other volunteers that did their own analysis and, and supplied it to us. And that's um, kind of a quick and dirty way of getting some idea of the, of the impacts. Uh, we just have a few links here. I think this slide should be a little bit later after we introduce some of these other products. But um, anyway, they're here, and they're also, I think, in the resources uh, pod. But where we are with the tool right now is we have on our website version what we call 1.2. Um, and then we moved into a version 2 that was more of an internal stage that was never released because we kept rolling on to <laughs> version 3. So that's what the team is working on now. Um, and Mike will talk about that. But that's available for anybody who's interested in, in, in kicking the tires on that at this point. And we'll hopefully we'll have that wrapped up. And, a couple of weeks and post it on our website so that 1.2 will be swapped out with a version 3. Point something. Um, and we've got other benefit cost resources at the link, the third link, of which some of those are shown here. One is a kind of a fundamental foundational piece, which is the operations BCA desk reference. Um, when you get into using TOPS BC, we have the original um, user's manual associated with that. It's the green the second uh, publication. And then we created two compendia of examples of uh, different illustrations of BCA, one on TISMO as a whole, and one the road weather team, Federal Highway, was interested in putting a particular spotlight on, um, on, on, on their program and, and the benefits of uh, road weather improvements. So that's uh, another compendium. So I think they have like 20 or 30 examples in each of those. So you can see the um, different ways in which BCA has been used across the country. So we have TOPS BC. We also have a few others. TIM BC, which is, again, one of those more focused um, uh, benefit cost tools, in that case, on traffic incident management. But as I said, TOPS BC is one we're, we're kind of uh, developing as, as a whole, cut across the different <coughs> strategies, screening tool. And that's uh, all I wanted to say, and I wanted to now have um, Mike Lawrence take it from here and have a little uh, required disclaimer to set up Mike's presentation. So Mike, take it away. Thank you, uh, thank you Jim. Uh, great introduction and uh, uh, queued everything up for me. I appreciate it. We start out, everybody read the disclaimer that uh, I'm a contractor and Federal Highway, of course, is uh, um, my client, but uh, I don't speak for them. I'm speaking for myself. Um, so I'm going to give you a, a pretty quick presentation today. I'm an economist, so I like talking about benefit cost analysis and things like that. So that's what I'll be doing for the next uh, oh, 30 minutes or so. And we'll try to get you uh, into the next couple of presentations to show you some examples of some similar work that's been done in the field. Uh, let me get over here. So that's me. Well, our first slide here we I borrowed from our friends at the Kansas City uh, Scout Program. Uh, I thought this was a great slide. It sort of summarizes everything that benefit cost analysis tries to do. It's about making decisions, and it's about the kind of information you can uh, gather together and organize and present in ways that uh, uh, decision makers can understand the uh, uh, situation and the alternatives and what happens if they don't do anything. And this slide, I think, uh, sort of nicely puts that together in a, in a scale. So what we're doing here is we're trying to weigh the benefits against the cost. In this particular example, um, they've got uh, color-coded uh, balls to indicate the different uh, categories of benefits and categories of cost. And this is obviously a very good program because there are a lot more uh, weight on the benefit side than on the cost side. But that's the objective of benefit cost analysis, being able to understand how the uh, benefits uh, outweigh the cost if they do, and how benefits and costs for individual projects or individual project alternatives uh, can be compared with one another to help make the best decision uh, for the traveling public. 
What I'm going to try to do in this uh, short period is I'm going to try to give you a very brief introduction to benefit cost analysis. I'm going to talk about some of the specific steps required for conducting a TISMO benefit cost analysis, talk a little bit about measuring costs and quantifying benefits, and I'm going to introduce TOPS BC, and the idea of TOPS BC, as Jim has already uh, introduced you to, is to try to do some of this work, this benefit cost work, in a very sketch planning uh, uh, level of detail so that the uh, analysts can very quickly gather information. They don't need very much information to run TOPS BC, and they can carry through with a benefit cost analysis to give them some very quick uh, information on, on projects and what looks good and, and what might need some refinement before it moves forward to the next stage. Federal Highway and the Department of Transportation have been doing a lot of work with benefit cost analysis for a couple of decades and produced a lot of different uh, resources to help planners, engineers, and uh, operators uh, move forward with uh, various types of economic analysis. These are three examples here, but there are many more. And, and uh, if you look around the uh, site that uh, Jim mentioned earlier, uh, you'll see that there are a number of resources there to, to help you with the process so that you can learn more about what's going on and, and what the alternatives might be. Well, there are many types of economic analysis, benefit cost analysis being one of those. Some of these get confused sometimes. They, people uh, think one is, is, uh, includes another or may not include another. So I just want to sort of define them a little bit for you as we go forward. Benefit cost analysis includes uh, both life cycle cost analysis and cost effectiveness analysis are kind of built into benefit cost analysis. Equity analysis is, is something different. Benefit cost analysis is something that moves forward with a set of uh, mathematical rules and you get to an answer. Equity analysis is, is uh, sort of the opposite. It's, it's what you think is fair and equitable. Um, and what you think is fair and equitable today may be different from what you think is fair and equitable tomorrow or what you think is fair and equitable may be different from what I think is fair and equitable. So it's a judgment as opposed to a, a mathematical calculation as benefit cost analysis is. Financial analysis usually refers to cash flow. Where's the money coming to uh, be able to move forward with a project and fund its operation and maintenance over time? Uh, all of this work, of course, always requires activity forecasting, so we have to produce levels of, you know, what's the level of, of traffic on the road? How does it change? How is it impacted by the projects we think about? Uh, all of this information, as you know, is, is often uncertain, so risk analysis can become important. How accurate is our information? Uh, how confident are we in the results that we can produce? Uh, and finally, economic impact analysis, uh, which is very similar to benefit cost analysis in that it uses the same kind of information, but it's really uh, quite different. Uh, so I, I want to just distinguish between the two for you here before I move on, uh, because they are often confused. Benefit cost analysis is about efficiency. Uh, it considers the direct impacts of a project on measures of effectiveness, and the traditional measures of effectiveness would be you know, travel demand, uh, excuse me, travel time, safety, emissions, fuel cost, productivities, and it's primarily for decision makers. It helps decision makers understand uh, what, the, what they get in the project if they commit resources to a, a particular activity. Economic impact, on the other hand, is, is about change. It could be positive change. It could be negative change. Uh, it's focused on the very broad regional economic activity and jobs. It considers both direct, indirect, and induced impacts of a project. So there's a lot of other things going on in an economic impact analysis. And it tends to be more for uh, politicians and the public. It's a way to explain what's going on. The, uh, we, we spend these resources and we get uh, employment as a result. We get uh, income and we get economic vitality for the community. That's a little different than analyzing the individual uh, project, which is what we're talking about with benefit cost analysis. So uh, how do we do a benefit cost analysis? What are the steps we go through in order to carry out a benefit cost analysis? We, had, we talk about 10 major ones, establishing objectives early, you know, what is it we're trying to do, identify the constraints and the assumptions. You know, economists make assumptions all the time. It's what we have to do to get to the answers, but we're okay and comfortable with that. But we have to be real specific about what they are so people can see what we're assuming. Uh, base case is extremely important because what we're talking about with um, an investment is changing what the current conditions are. So we need to know what they are now in order to measure 
where, they're, where we're going to be in the future when we make these investments. We need to set an analysis period. Uh, that can be important. Uh, it needs to be long enough to cover cycles of the uh, particular investments. So some uh, equipment costs may repeat after five years or 10 years. Others may last for 20 years. So we have to be clear about the analysis period and it takes into account the various components of our project. Um, we need to define the level of effort. We talk about TOPS BC being a sketch planning tool. As you get closer to deployment of a project, you want uh, higher than sketch planning analysis. You need better and more accurate information. And so we sort of move up the scale as we move forward. Um, we mentioned traffic effects being very important. They drive a lot of the benefits of our projects. We estimate benefits and costs relative to the base case. That base case has to be uh, well established and we determine what we have in the future. We have to make sure that we're uh, accounting for future values uh, as opposed just to the current values. So um, we'll talk a little about discounting in a minute, but that's the way we get from future values of either benefits or costs to present value. Uh, we want to evaluate risk. I mentioned that before, very important. There's uncertainty in all of this process. We want to compare uh, net benefits and rank alternatives. So we get these values of net benefits and the benefit cost ratio, and we can compare those across individual projects. And we want to be careful about recommendations. So there need to be ways in which we present this information to the decision makers, which are clear, um, and confirm the information that we've collected and provided. Let's talk a little about costs and benefits. So we're going to start out with just a list uh, on the uh, cost side, the right side of this chart. And the usual costs, equipment, operations and maintenance, software, communications, installation. Of course, there are many others. We talk a lot about agency costs. You know, how, how will a project affect agency costs? Um, if we're talking about uh, road treatments for <clears throat> road, uh, winter weather management, for example, do Different programs affect the amount of materials that are required, the effect amount of time required by agency staff. How do you account for those in the benefit cost analysis? On the benefit side, we talk about reducing congestion. So we, we save travel time, we improve reliability in the trips, we reduce crashes, we save energy, and, and there are other benefits as well, some of which are, are more difficult to quantify than the ones I've listed here. So on the cost side, cost quantification, we look to price lists to be able to identify what the components of the project cost. Uh, we have the, uh, Jim mentioned this uh, a little bit earlier, data such as the, ITS, the FHWA ITS cost database, which is available at that website. This provides historic ITS deployment costs from existing projects. So as those projects are completed and reports are produced, the ITS cost uh, database collects that information and makes it available. Uh, to uh, users. We use a lot of this information uh, in uh, developing TOPS and we update it with new information as it becomes available and then the latest data is always available to you to update the, within cost the assumptions that have already been made. And of course previous projects are all, often uh, an excellent source of information on what a, <coughs> excuse me, what a project costs. The challenge can often be benefit quantification. How do we determine what we get out of this particular project that we're going to deploy? There are various measures, some of which I've mentioned uh, already. Traditional, including travel time savings, vehicle operating costs, emissions, safety. There are some new emerging uh, measures of effectiveness, like reliability. The SHARP-2 program, of course, had a, an entire component built around the, the issue of reliability, identifying and measuring it, uh, being able to talk about it. Induced travel and consumer surplus are very important issues. Climate change, a new emissions that we uh, think about in these analyses. And there are other measures of effectiveness that are much more difficult to quantify. That doesn't mean we ignore them in a benefit cost analysis. We usually bring them in uh, qualitatively. Things like quality of life, uh, customer satisfactions, the feelings of safety and security, things of that nature. On the monetiza benefit monetization side, which is what we're trying to do with all of our information in a benefit cost analysis, we're trying to get to dollar values. So we need value of time, value of reliability, value of life. We need all this cost information, price information in order to uh, convert um, our uh, measures of effectiveness, change in time or change in number of crashes, we need to convert them into dollars. So we need these prices. Um, other important concepts in benefit cost analysis, I'm not going to have much time to talk about it all today, but 
We talked a little about risk and uncertainty, calculating the benefit-cost ratio and net benefits, two ways to look at the, the answers. Present value and discounting, I'll talk a little about that in a second. Um, quantified benefits, many benefits are not, we're not able to quantify, but we still need to recognize them. Uh, presenting benefit-cost analysis results to decision makers, so the answers are, are clear and understandable. And then there are various uh, tools for benefit-cost analysis at TISMO, which we'll talk a little bit about as well. So on the uh, schedule for cost and benefits, you know, cost and benefits don't follow the same path. Usually we have a, a high cost in the year zero when we're building the project, high capital cost. Uh, and then over time, we'll have uh, maintenance costs and some equipment replacement over time, a pretty steady stream of costs over the life of the project. Benefits uh, behave differently. They may start out low and grow as this graph has. They may start out low and then grow very quickly and be up to uh, a steady level um, in only a few years. But they sort of stay at that level or maybe grow a little bit over time, maybe shrink a little bit over time, but they're pretty, they're pretty predictable year to year. So present value and discounting, we talk a little bit about a dollar is not always worth a dollar, and that's two reasons for that. One is inflation, uh, which is the general uh, change in price level. For example, a 2018 dollar will not buy as much in 2023, and at 2% inflation, you'd need a dollar ten in 2023 in order to to uh, buy the same goods you were able to buy in, in 2018. And that two dollar ten in the future is actually not as good as having a dollar today because the uh, money also has time value, what economists call time value. So we'd rather have a dollar today than a dollar in a year because that dollar we have today, we can invest, we can use it, we can. In, enjoy the benefits of having that dollar over that year, so it takes more than a dollar to balance a dollar today. So we use discounting in all components of benefit cost analysis so that we can compare uh, equal values uh, for costs and benefits as they occur over time. A hierarchy of benefit cost analysis tools, Jim has talked a little about this. You know, there are a variety of spreadsheets around to do benefit cost analysis. Benefit cost analysis is, is mostly arithmetic, so it's pretty straightforward stuff. There are internet tools like BCA.net, which was de uh, developed by the uh, Office of Asset Management at Federal Highway. That's an internet-based system. There are transportation program areas like the uh, IDOT system and TOPSBC, which we'll talk about a little today. And then there are te technology-specific tools like the Clear Roads Project, which is uh, winter road maintenance, or the Traffic Incident Management BCA. Uh, these are available for you know the specific um, individual technologies or strategies, they go beyond what the TOPS BC is able to provide. So what is TOPS BC? It, TOPS, is, TOPS is a tool to assist operators, uh, planners, and other state DOT and MPO staff conduct sketch planning, benefit cost analysis of operations projects. We do workshops around the country on these on TOPS BC at various DOTs, and one of the things we like to think is that by the end of a one-day workshop, the folks who attend that workshop can actually do a full benefit cost analysis using TOPS PC. It's, very use, it's a very user-friendly, Excel-based uh, tool that addresses most operation strategies and technologies and, and provides the tools even to go beyond what's uh, built into the model uh, today. It allows a user to optimize the TISMO BCA data for further analysis. So you can organize your information, uh, put it together, it's in this, this tool, and as you move from the sketch planning level to a, a more detailed analysis, maybe you're getting ready to deploy and you want more accurate uh, analysis, you can use the organization of the data within TOPS BC to update the information and get better uh, information as you go forward. Jim already mentioned the, the sort of list of strategies that we use in, in TOPS BC that the analyst can evaluate. They fall into various categories, traveler information, traffic signal systems, ramp metering, freight strategies, uh, ATM, incident management, and a variety of others. Um, all of these are available in TOPS BC, and some other analysis beyond what's in the list can be conducted uh, with a sort of smart use of TOPS BC. TOPS BC has three major components to it, a benefits section, a cost section, and a results section. And the benefits section includes analysis of those um, measures of effectiveness we talked about, uh, time savings, reliability, safety, environment, energy on the cost side. Uh, top says what we call basic uh, uh, infrastructure costs. So this is how the backbone of the system, the, the 
traffic management system, for example, uh, has incremental costs. These are focused on the numbers of the technologies to be deployed. So how many ramp meters will you, you deploy? How many intersections will you uh, be deploying the, the technology in? How many vehicles will you purchase, purchase for your uh, traffic incident management uh, system? It has O&M costs and it has a useful life expectancy for all of the individual components uh, that make up the cost. And it calculates uh, benefits and costs for these technologies, um, both the uh, um, present value of net benefits and the benefit cost ratio, all in a, a user-friendly framework. One, one focus of uh, TOPS is that the user should be able to do a benefit cost analysis with very little information uh, to start with. Uh, the user can build new information over time and improve what's in TOPS, but it can, you can get an analysis, a benefit-cost ratio out very quickly. The kind of cost information you need to know is what technology is, is going to be, uh, you're going to be deploying, the number of deployments, when, when it will be deployed, and what period you want to analyze it over. On the benefit side, you need to know uh, what the length of the peak period is, you need to know the facility type, the number of lanes, some uh, segment length and throughput, some information about the facility that you're analyzing. TOPS has defaults for almost everything else. Um, those defaults are all overridable, though. The user can uh, convert almost any TOPS default into a, a value that the user would be more comfortable with. So when you open uh, TOPS BC, this is the opening screen. Um, you can see that there are sort of three main components that the user can click on and, and use. One is based uh, a cost-based piece, one is a benefit-based piece, benefit cost-based piece, and one uh, that provides additional information about TISMO strategies. So the user selects uh, whichever one they uh, wish to look at and also the uh, individual technology. This page is uh, sort of, uh, you're not supposed to be able to read this, so don't feel too bad about that. But I wanted to give you an idea of what the, the page looks like, the layout of the page. So on the left-hand side, we have what we call the navigation bar, and it lists all of the various uh, technologies on the cost side and on the benefit side. These are all individual pages. There's a place where some analysis is done. There's a place where some uh, graphics are produced. And there's an area where uh, the uh, costs and benefits, or in this case, the costs are, are uh, developed over time and some discounting is accomplished. These little tabs at the bottom, they're all individual numbers now, but on a normal uh, top spreadsheet, they're actually names of sectors that correspond to the names that are up in the navigation bar. It's a spreadsheet, so you can navigate either by the navigation bar, or you can go to individual pages and navigate as well. This is what a, a typical cost sheet looks like in TOPS BC. This happens to be traffic incident management. There's a cost sheet for about 20 some odd uh, individual strategies and technologies. And this is the what we call the basic infrastructure equipment uh, portion of the cost sheet. So there are line items that uh, uh, of cost and TOPS has assumptions about uh, the useful life, uh, the capital, initial capital or replacement capital cost, and the operations and maintenance cost for that equipment. And then uh, TOPS calculates the annualized cost, and it sums them uh, for the user as well. On the same sheet just below that, we have the incremental cost. So this is the number of, of uh, individual items that would be uh, deployed. In this case, we're talking about traffic incident management. So we have vehicles. Uh, we have incident response labor and communication lines. So um, we have to tell it how many vehicles, in this case, uh, uh, seven vehicles and uh, 25 communication lines, um, and that provides some cost. And then, and then uh, TOPS, the user, has to start with uh, these green cells. By the way, any of those numbers above, the user can override and put in their own values for those numbers, and TOPS will then calculate a new average cost. <clears throat> this is for the number of uh, deployments that the uh, user will identify, or first the uh, the basic infrastructure, usually this number is one. You know, usually you have one a traffic management center, but you could have uh, more. This is for the number of deployments. This could be a statewide activity where they're deploying seven trucks in 20 different locations around the state. And the year of deployment, uh, this is when the project uh, would be constructed or purchased, and this is uh, in 2019 in this particular case. 
This is uh, an example of a benefit page where the user, again, is asked to fill in the green cells to provide information about the uh, length of the peak period, the kind of facility, uh, the number of lanes, some descriptions of the facility. Uh, the uh, blue cells are cells that are calculated by, uh, by TOPS based on the information that was put in over here and the use of the um, um, various calculations that are, are done here. So the user is making assumptions in the green cells. The yellow cells are the calculations. The highway capacity manual is used to calculate the uh, capacity of the road. And the uh, speed flow curves are used to calculate uh, speeds in the uh, default case. Uh, in the uh, option case, these, number, these values uh, will be changed based on the information we have about the technology, what its uh, usual benefits are, how it impacts traffic, how it impacts speed, um, how the travel time index changes, uh, et cetera. Let's see. So what, what's new in TOPS 3.0? Uh, has updated uh, basically all of the defaults in the tool have been updated. Uh, there's new cost uh, data for strategies. Uh, these have come from various places, including the ITS uh, cost database that I mentioned. They're now all collected into a single place in the cost default matrix. We've added four new <coughs> freight strategies. We've added new ATM detail. Uh, we've added Sharp 2 reliability estimates to each of the uh, benefit categories. Uh, we've added uh, graphics to, to support the cost and benefit sheet. And we've set up methods to do some iterative analysis uh, with TOPS. Um, new freight strategies include traffic parking and reservation systems, e-compliance for trucks and truck-only lanes, and that includes tolled and non-tolled lanes. Uh, it can handle both short uh, uh, truck-only lanes, uh, less than five miles, for example, or it can deal with uh, long truck-only lanes that might be uh, hundreds of miles and include tolls. Uh, and we also include uh, truck climbing lanes uh, strategy. So estimating reliability benefits, this is another new category. So we're, we're trying to uh, understand travel time reliability, how it can be uh, a benefit, uh, additional benefit of the uh, investments in the, the system. Uh, the SHARP-2 analysis has given us a, a way to measure these things, the travel time index, uh, key measure of, of uh, the mean travel time, and the probability of on-time assurance, so TTI-80 says that uh, on-time arrival, 80% of uh, all trips. So if you, if you need to be uh, at your uh, particular location um, with a great deal of assurance, say 80% of the time, uh, then you need to leave a certain amount of uh, extra buffer time uh, in order to be sure that uh, uh, you are uh, on time 80% of the time. And, of course, some jobs might need uh, 90 or 95 or, or, or higher uh, levels or some trips. Um, this is uh, the distribution of trip time. It gives you an idea. This is from the SHARP-2 um, L11 reports. It gives you some idea of what these various categories uh, are and where they fit uh, on the distribution of trips. This could be a, a, a full set of trips or it could be trips, a portion of trips. So. Just say the freeway portion of an individual trip. It's important to note that that, that this is just for one origin, one destination, and one uh, uh, leaving time, one initiation of the trip time. So there are lots of uh, various ways this distribution can be shaped, and uh, TOPS has uh, tapped into the Sharp Two uh, information to allow you to include that in your benefit cost analysis. Another way to look at some of those uh, values, again from uh, Sharp Two. So the, uh, the lower blue line is the free flow uh, speed uh, and the travel time over here on the index. So this would be a six-minute trip. And then uh, on average, however, with the traffic, that falls to 10 minutes for the mean. And the uh, buffer time is the amount you need to add to that in order to get to the planning time index, which is 95% of the um, on-time arrival. So. So I covered a lot there in a little bit of time. I thank you for your attention. What we're going to do now is move to a couple of uh, individual state examples. And let's see. I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie. Stephanie, uh, it's all yours. Thank you. 
Thank you, Michael. Um, now I'm going to be talking a little bit about a, a project where we actually used the TOPS model um, a couple years ago when we were planning, but also um, just recently we updated it in order to get the true cost um, and the performance measures that we're seeing in the field. So what I want to do is just give you a brief overview of what our project entails so you can kind of understand what the, the benefits are of the system, and then we'll go over the cost um, that we expended, and then finally we'll get into the TOPS model and what the, um, how we used it and the results. So uh, this was our first active traffic management project in Michigan. Um, we branded it the Flex Route. It's on US 23, just north of Ann Arbor, and it's an area where we have reoccurring directional peak hour congestion. So southbound in the morning, it's very heavy traffic, and northbound in the afternoon. Um, outside of that, the, the traffic is really um, not too bad. However, when we do have an incident, we also have some pretty significant delay because there's really not an alternate route in the area. And then finally, we are um, located very close to the University of Michigan, and we have a lot of special events. So we have the congestion related to special events. Um, it's an older corridor, and so we had several interchange and mainline operational issues, so we were going into the corridor anyway to fix um, some bridges and do some road work. So we evaluated this corridor and thought, thought it was a perfect um, application for active traffic management. So this is what our active traffic management system looks like. We basically have these gantries. They're, it's eight and a half miles long. They're spaced about a half mile apart. And um, so we have um, lane control signs over each lane and also additional um, message signs um, for the corridor. But what we do, we use dynamic shoulder use. So we are using it southbound in the morning and northbound in the afternoon just during those peak periods. And we're using the median shoulder for um, our dynamic shoulder use. And then also, because we have the signs over every lane, we also can do dynamic lane control, which happens to be very helpful during incidents or also during construction. And then we have a variable speed advisory system and a cue warning system, which is very helpful in smoothing those speeds and also helping prevent secondary um, incidents and um, also just incidents related to congestion. So this is kind of what our dynamic shoulder looks like. This You're seeing a picture of our, um, our active traffic management software actually running. Um, on the left, you're seeing our camera views of the corridor. In the center column, you're actually seeing what the corridor looks like from the software, and then it's populated in the field. But So the center one you're seeing in the morning, we have a green arrow over that shoulder. We're opening the shoulder to traffic, and we post 60 mile per hour advisory speed um, for that corridor. But then if you look to the far right, that's what um, our northbound looks like in the morning. So in the northbound, we put a red X over the shoulder. Um, drivers are not allowed to use it. And they drive as they normally do in the existing two lanes. So as I mentioned, we also use the system for dynamic lane use. So um, you can see in the picture on the left, this is a um, sample where we had an incident in our corridor. And the emergency responders were, the, the incident was in the right lane, but the emergency responders kind of encringed on the um, center lane or the um, median lane. So we were able to, and you can look on the right side there, um, you can see the graphic of what the drivers were seeing. Basically, we were able to open up the shoulder, move everybody over to the left, and have them use the left shoulder and then that center lane, and close the right lane. And then actually, right before the incident, we actually moved them over even further just direct to the left shoulder. And you can kind of see that in that picture on the left. You can see how everybody got all the way over to the right and gave those um, incident responders some room to work. Um, this is an example of what our variable speed system looks like. So um, basically, we use real, real travel times. We're um, computing them every 30 seconds and updating um, them every minute. So these are real-time conditions. We post a maximum of 60 miles per hour. They are advisory speeds in our state. Um, so what you can see here, if you look at, at the um, cameras in the center, if you look at the one on the lower right um, that shows 50 miles per hour, because this one is actually at toward the end of our um, 
kind of shoulder running area. So we actually go from three lanes to two, and this is quite often where we'll have a slowdown there, and the speeds automatically update and slow the drivers down prior to, to um, reaching that congestion. And then last but not least, we have a queue warning system, which is um, personally the, my favorite part of the ATM system. And what I'm showing here is this was a specific day where we had an uh, um, incident, a crash, about two and a half miles downstream of our corridor. So it's outside of our ATM corridor, about two and a half miles. And it was during the morning peak, so what had happened is traffic had backed up two and a half miles and just had reached our corridor. And it, it's hard to see because I usually use a video here, but the, the graphic in the center is showing this is our traffic starting to slow down. And if you look at the right column, you will see this is what we were posting on the signs, and actually it automatically started dri um, warning drivers that there were slow speeds for the next one mile. And then the, the variable speeds actually will step them down from 50 miles per hour to 40 to 30. And then finally, when we reach um, anything lower than 30 miles per hour, we will post slow. So it, it helps um, prepare the drivers so that we can reduce those um, congestion-related crashes. So we've been operational since January of 2018. We actually opened late of, um, fall of 2017, but we still had some construction going on. But in January, we removed all the barrels. We were actually fully operational. So since then, we've um, been able to track our travel times, speeds, planning time index, and also our crash data. Um, from We use RIDIS to um, take real, um, we use probe data basically to track um, these performance measures. So we were able to get actual data um, on how it's performing. We're also tracking operations and maintenance costs and, of course, feedback from um, all of our agency partners, the public, really to try to improve the system. But what's nice about this is it's able, we are able to get actual um, calculated benefits from what we're seeing. Um, in the southbound direction, and the reason this, the southbound direction is actually operating very well, and that's because at the end of this quarter, we actually open up to four lanes. So there, there's really not any sort of bottleneck afterwards. And we are seeing planning time improvements of over 50% in the corridor. Um, travel time savings of about five minutes, which maybe doesn't sound like that much, but when you think it's only an eight-and-a-half-mile corridor, it's pretty significant. And then we're redu we were increasing speeds of about 20 miles per hour. In the northbound direction, um, really the, the improvements were minimal due to the fact that at the, at the end of the northbound, we really um, we go down to the two lanes. However, what we've noticed is over the, since we've gotten into the summer months, we actually are starting to see some improvement in planning times because the summer's a little more congested in this area due to tourist traffic. So we're starting to see about 15 to 25% improvements in planning time now for the northbound direction. So here is a summary of the cost. I'll just go through these pretty quick. The system cost about $16 million to actually build the infrastructure. And it's costing us about $250,000 a year just to have an operator operate the system. So that's like our, our staffing cost for its operation. The maintenance of the system, we are still determining because it's so early, but we're estimating that's going to cost somewhere in the three hundred dollars to $400,000 a year range. So why that's important is um, these are the kinds of information you need and the benefit cost analysis. Um, so if you see here, this is what we input in TOPS, and this was actually before the project um, during the planning stages. And these are the inputs that we inputted. And in general, they came from our vSIM model or from other states, um, like the crash reduction rate came from other states and looking at what they had experienced. So we put in all of our benefits, and then the costs, just like Michael was talking about, these are the costs that go into the um, spreadsheet. And our results were um, pretty significant. So what you're seeing here is both a summary of our, what we have got from TOPS, and we also did um, a TIGER grant application, so I had that to compare it to. And I think the real thing to look at here is that third row there where you see the averaged annual benefits. And TOPS, had, um, we had about $11.6 million in an annual benefit calculated using those inputs where our traditional uh, methods 
um, we only had about half that when it's when it's you know your typical traffic engineering trying to figure out the benefits versus going through this which involves a lot more so we had um, very good um, benefit to cost and and one thing I should mention is that those were based on our projected um, benefits and what we're seeing in the field is actually higher so when we go um, all the costs were correct but when we um, put the when we input the new benefits, we're, um, or you know the the speed savings and the travel time savings, we're expecting that this number would even go up more. So with that, I think it's um, time for you to start putting your questions in the question pod, and I will turn it over to Matt Hansen from Caltrans to talk a little bit about his project. Um, hello. <clears throat> I just turned it off mute, so can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, truck parking and a project we started uh, uh, about 10 years ago, actually, I guess, or we got the grant back then anyway, back in uh, 2008. Um, and it's to develop and provide truck parking information. Uh, and uh, specifically aimed at, at truckers. So it was uh, led primarily by UC Berkeley as uh, Federal Highways and Caltrans funded. And uh, two of the, the key goals are to broadcast or disseminate uh, truck parking information through web and uh, mobile applications. Um, and then advance the display of uh, dynamic truck parking availability. Um, so the problem, and I'll probably spend a little bit more time on this, uh, so um, just because the, I think it's more applicable when we start talking about cost benefit, and I think we have uh, a little bit more of the costs. We don't have so much of the benefits now, and um, I think that's something we're working on. Uh, so, so setting the stage. So back in 2008, we had the we were in the middle of the Great Recession. Uh, truck volumes were lower. Truck parking, the truck parking shortage, was not as acute as it is currently. Uh, we saw an opportunity to develop uh, the inf information side of truck parking, um, like a lot of other apps and uh, primarily with truck parking space availability uh, data. Um, and we applied for a truck parking initiative grant um, and, and received it. Uh, one premise we have is that if you give truckers good traveler information, they will make better uh, decisions. Uh, and that would benefit both freight operations as well as highway operations. Another premise is that better management of existing truck parking uh, is like effectively getting three to four percent additional parking, um, and that's something we got from uh, the Transportation Sustainability Research Institute. And let's see, so the UC Berkeley, um, just to recognize recognize them, um, uh, it's part of the Institute of Transportation Studies at Berkeley, and specifically, it's the transportation. Transportation Sustainability Research Institute. And so from their uh, uh, research on passenger car parking, um, that's where we got the uh, 3 to 4% uh, effective uh, number of trucking spaces, better, better utilization. Um, and then uh, there's an ongoing need to develop uh, benefit, benefit cost matrix for truck parking and other uh, truck travel information services. And so the problem, um, there's a number of problems with uh, uh, truck parking. Uh, truck drivers in California and, and across the, the country face chronic shortages. Uh, truck drivers don't know, they don't have good information and know if parking is available or will be available when they arrive. Uh, when truck drivers can't find a place to park, then they'll park illegally and many times on highway off-ramps, shoulders, uh, local streets and roads, um, and that can be dangerous uh, for both the public and the truckers. 
And you know, part of the problem is, is that parking a truck, uh, since they're so big, uh, there's a lot of regulations on where they can't park. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult task. So um, in addition to uh, what's on the slide, a good economy uh, has led to high freight volumes um, in the time between 2008 and now. Uh, the relatively new hours of service rules and electronic data logging mandate by federal motor carriers has exac exacerbated the truck parking problem. Um, and what I've heard from truckers many times uh, in the past, you know, few years is that information is nice, but what they really need, they really, really need is more truck parking spaces in the right locations. So truck parking has impacts on safety, both traveler safety with cars crashing into trucks parked on shoulders and ramps, uh, which doesn't happen that often, but it does happen. Uh, and truck driver personal safety, uh, Jason's law was a law that was passed. Um, and is, is named after uh, truck driver Jason Rivenberg, who was robbed and fatally shot in South Carolina in 2009 after pulling off to rest at an abandoned, abandoned gas station. Um, so that's the personal safety. Uh, highway maintenance, including damage to highway facilities. Uh, highway and uh, ramp shoulders weren't designed or, or constructed to handle the weight of heavy trucks. Um, and so they, they uh, get damaged very easily with uh, trucks parked repeatedly on them. Unauthorized truck parking locations usually don't have any facilities, so maintenance workers have to clean up and are potentially exposed to, to biohazardous waste. Uh, air quality is an issue. Trucks emit criteria pollutants and greenhouse gases when the trucks drive around looking for parking, uh, and if they are parked on the side uh, of the road idling. Um, and there's just more ways to, to mitigate that in an in a, um, authorized, you know, truck parking facility. Highway operations, truckers looking for parking impact traffic uh, as they drive around. And this happens mostly on local roads. And I'm sure everybody here has been behind a, a truck and been uh, facilitated or frustrated uh, and, you know, wanting to pass them as soon as they can. Uh, and then freight operations. The American Truck uh, Trucking Research Institute study estimates that driving time is cut short uh, one hour or about 10% of a driver's working time because truckers start looking for parking early to avoid going over the hours of service rules. Uh, for an individual uh, trucker, that is a loss of about $4,600 a year. And there are estimates, estimates that this equates to about a $5 billion loss uh, to the industry as a whole. So uh, what is dynamic truck parking availability? Um, one of the goals of the project is to provide accurate and timely parking availability um, information to truckers. If they understand when and where parking is available, they can make better travel choices. Um, as another part of the uh, um, truckers can use information to understand when and where parking is available. And we've used a number of different approaches, um, counting trucks going in and out of lots, um, and then uh, doing the, the arithmetic and, and uh, to know the number of truck parking spaces available. Um, Spot-specific sensing, where you put sensors uh, right in the, uh, the truck parking spaces and you know if there's uh, a truck or another vehicle um, there or not. Um, and human counts, and then estimations of parking availability. And we've found that the human counts have so far been um, uh, the most accurate, um, but they only work in, in certain, um, uh, let's say, uh, truck parking, facility uh, setups. Most truck parking um, facilities have uh, wide uh, driveways and trucks going in and out simultaneously and uh, funny turning angles and stuff. And I'll show a picture of uh, one of our uh, truck parking facilities. Um, so in facilities where they have a gate and they monitor the trucks going in and out, um, of course, they get the, the the best, the best data 
and give us uh, the ability to get to provide the most accurate uh, parking space ability data. Um, and another part of uh, uh, as part of another project, my colleague uh, Elliot, who I think is on the phone or on this on this call, has developed a proto prototype forecasting model, which we hope will someday be able to accurately estimate truck parking availability one or two or more hours before a, a scheduled stop. So uh, some of the main challenges that we've had um, to uh, developing these uh, sensing systems, um, still that, I don't know if we would call it cutting it so much now. There's a lot of truck parking activities going on now and a lot of uh, development going on. Um, but we just know that feedback from truck stops and uh, truckers is critically important um, and that counting trucks cost effectively especially is 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 a very difficult uh, problem and again has to do with how uh, truck uh, facilities are, are set up and how uh, trucks come in and out of those facilities um, the sensing systems we've tried a number of different uh, technology inductive loops RFID uh, manual counts video um, and uh, all these technologies are still ad ad advancing in terms of truck parking. Most of them exist for other applications, but um, the trick is to get them working properly in a, in a truck environment. And then the end goal, of course, is to deliver reliable um, parking available information to truck drivers through web and, and mobile platforms. This is a picture of the Flying J Travel Plaza in Lodi, California, uh, just north of Stockton, California, and about 30 or 40 minutes south of Sacramento. Um, and, and in this picture, you can see the entrance and exit. Let's see how this works. There we go. Um, we put, uh, this was a very simple, we put in inductive loops on the county road outside. Um, and we can and we can count the vehicles uh, going in and out of the facility, the net vehicles. Um, the site is is no longer up and showing data now because uh, they built another truck stop directly across the street, and um, so now the driveways are pretty much directly you know opposite of the driveways you see in this picture. And so uh, we have no way of figuring out which way the trucks are turning. So um, we do have availability data, but it's for um, both facilities um, at this point. Um, and that just shows the, the routes of the truckers used to, to go in and out of the facility. Um, uh, the stars are where we had uh, put cameras to um, do some validation. Um, sorry, too far. So, um, because we have to figure out, we have to reset the counts every day um, to zero, and that's usually, usually at night. Um, but we need to verify the, the data and uh, make sure the, the counts are right. And uh, this just shows. Um, uh, the chart of the trucker preferences for the for the um, their wanting to use or their willingness to use uh, the internet to look up truck parking space availability. As you can see, there's about 80, I think 82 percent of truckers said, you know, is uh, probably useful. Um, and as part of determining user needs, we did a couple of trucker intercept surveys, uh, one under another project just before we got this grant, and one as part of this grant. And there's a similar chart on trucker willingness to pay. Uh, we're well over 50% of the truckers that we surveyed were willing to pay for truck parking reservations. Um, and um, next slide. Um, and so we developed uh, American Truck Parking. Uh, it's a website and system to um, get information to truckers, not only the dynamic parking information, 
uh, but also uh, amenities and uh, it shows truck, private truck parking facilities, public rest areas, um, fueling locations, and that includes alternate fuel locations, electrification, and then, and then of course, the dynamic parking availability. This is a picture of the website. At the top, you can see Sacramento. Um, you can't quite see uh, Stockton in the middle of the map. Uh, uh, the yellow, you can just see a little bit of yellow there, um, and that's one of our active uh, uh, truck stops showing dynamic parking availability. And it's yellow because uh, when I when I uh, did the screenshot, it was only at uh, 10 to 25 percent of had had only about 10 to 25 percent of the spaces available. Um, if you look at the grayed out the grayed areas at the top. Uh, these are all um, drop-down menus where you can search for um, and, and filter for different kinds of information for type of fuel, um, you know, personal conveniences, you know, the hours, service, uh, truck services like truck washes, oil changes, etc. And um, our database, I think it's one of the more complete databases in the nation. We have pretty much all the safety roadside rest areas in the nation. Uh, we have many of the truck parking facilities um, on the uh, west. We have almost all the truck parking facilities on the west coast. We have most of the uh, facilities west of the Mississippi and are working or on improving our coverage in the, the rest of the country. Um, and it just shows that uh, um, our website we developed with a, a, a spe specific format called adaptive theming so that it not only works on desktop machines and tablets, but will also work on a, a cell phone. Um, we actually had a mobile app at one time, but we found that the mobile app was um, uh, too time um, intensive because um, they have to be updated all the time as operating system changes and um, you know, there's two major operating systems out there for cell phones, so um, it got to be too much trouble. So we went back and we redid the, the um, website so that it had this adaptive theming, um, and we use the same website for all devices. And just uh, project status, uh, we have uh, four. Uh, truck stops that are outfitted with uh, technologies. Um, I will say that the 49er in Sacramento at the bottom is the only one that's operational right now. Um, no, not the 49ers. I'm sorry. The, the second one, Logistics Terminal in Lathrop, is the one, the only one that's operational right now. Um, we've had technical issues with uh, the other sites, the 49er. Uh, their gate broke down, so they're putting in a new system, and we will have our system up and running uh, once they get their gate, uh, new gate installed. Uh, the Flying J and Lodi, I think I just explained that, that the uh, uh, new truck stop opened across the street, and the detection system we, we put up um, can't tell which way the trucks are going, so if we have availability data, it's availability data for both um, the, the Loves and the, the Flying J parking uh, facilities. And the Loves and Santa Nella is uh, just uh, communication issues. Again, I talked about that earlier. It's been, it's been fairly difficult getting these systems up and running and having them be reliable. So um, with that, um, uh, if you want a, a more information, um, I want to give kudos to Elliot Martin, who's done most of the heavy lifting for this project, um, both, uh, you know, the, the technical out there and going out to the truck stops and, and getting the systems up and running and, and also on the, the database and uh, managing the database and the website. So uh, with that, um, I'll turn it over to, uh, I guess, I'm going to do the question and answer right now, so. Thanks, Matt. Um... Thanks to all the presenters. Uh, it was all great information. Um, uh, so for this part of the 
webinar for the next 15 minutes. We want you to put in your questions here in the question pod and just take advantage of uh, a great panel that we have here. Uh, just like Jim mentioned, uh, other than uh, the four presenters here, we have uh, Tom Carney, we have uh, Ralph Wolfie, both from FHWA uh, present, and also we have Nicole Cohen from Lidos, who also will help with the question and answer. So let me hand it over to Nicole to read the questions that we have so far. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, at this time, we only have one unanswered question in the chat pod, so I encourage you, if you have a question, to go ahead and get it typed in. Um, the question comes from Caroline, and it's directed to Stephanie. Since the ATM deployment, has anyone from your, from your team gone back to compare current benefits, crash rates, incident clearance times, et cetera, to what they were projected to be in the planning stage? Um. Hi, this is Stephanie. So um, we are tracking that, but unfortunately, we don't have we don't have all the information yet. So as far as the crash rate rates, um, our crash data here in Michigan is about four months behind. So right now, um, we we basically only have crashes good through April. We have looked at the at the crash patterns and the and the basically the crash rates. And what what we saw at first is um, the crashes went down. And then the next couple months, they went up a little bit. So it, it was really hard to determine so far in that first four months what's going on because some of it was related to winter weather. So we're not quite sure yet. One thing we do know about the crashes, they they seem to be going down in general, but we it looks like they are going up at the north end of our system where we actually have to take when we when we drop that shoulder um, so we go from three lanes to two lanes it does appear just north of our flex route that we're having more crashes there so we are looking into um, all of those the details the time of day and all of that as far as incident clearance times we we do not have the results yet, but we are doing a full research study. It'll be starting this fall and going for the next two years to track all of that as, as well as um, customer feedback, so the crashes, the, the you know the um, travel time performance and and the public feedback. Um, but and we also have the tools to actually do that. The only issue is because our we had just built the software for the system, and in order to get it up and operational in one year, the reporting functions had to come a little bit later. So the reports that we pull from our system to see um, the use of our um, system for incident clearance, we're not, not quite there yet. It'll probably be about a month. And then we should start, we're going to start compiling that. And we plan to, to kind of have like these monthly performance measures. And we will have something on incidents in that. Thank you, Stephanie. We do have um, a few people typing into the chat pod. But while they queue up their questions, I know, Mike, you had a few questions at the end of your presentation that you wanted to pose to the participants. Did you want to take a look at that? Um, yeah, sure, absolutely. Let me uh, go back to my list here. I'll get it up in a second. So we've done these, uh, we've done other webinars on TOPS, and I mentioned before we've, we've done a number of workshops around the country. And uh, what we're trying to do is, is get people uh, more informed about uh, doing benefit cost analysis and the kind of tools that are available to do it, either with TOPS or with uh, some of the other tools you've heard about today, or even with individual spreadsheets. But we'd also like to get feedback from uh, anyone listening today about the things we've talked about. I know an hour and a half is not much time to, to do uh, you know, a thorough review of, of what we've been doing and what Federal Highway has been accumulating in the benefit cost area. And Jim showed a lot of those reports uh, earlier. So we would appreciate any feedback that you could give us uh, on, you know, how we've organized and structured the uh, webinar, uh, whether you think that other kinds of information would have been uh, good to provide during the webinar. Um, we have also done webinars where we've done sort of hands-on uh, presentations of the tools, so we would uh, open the Excel spreadsheet and actually walk through it. 
that takes a, a, a little more time and a, a pretty dedicated uh, audience to do that. But uh, with some smaller audiences, we've been able to do that. But any feedback you can give us on uh, what you like and don't like and what you'd like to see in a presentation like this, we would love to hear it. Thanks, Mike. And we do have um, two more questions in the chat. Another one for you, Stephanie. For VSL, you mentioned speed is detected every 30 seconds. What is the mean of detection? What is the means of detection? So we have um, MVDSs, or microwave vehicle detection system, all the way throughout the corridor. Um, so we have pretty dense MVDSs. And so we're, we're calculating those real-time speeds. And then I should also mention that it, there's an algorithm that's smoothing those speeds so that we don't you know, have like a real quick drop in speed and then we, we actually drop the, the variable speed. So there's a smoothing that's going on in the algorithm. But we are those are actual detection. We don't use our probe data for that. We do collect probe data, but for this system, it's all based on detection. Thank you, Stephanie. And then Mike or Jim, whichever one of you would like to answer, how do the participants get access to TOPS 3.1? I knew that there are links over here, but uh, if you also want to tell them after the webinar where they can access the information. Sure. Well, there, there are uh, a couple of ways to do it. One is on the uh, TOPS BC Resources uh, downlink uh, box on the, the screen. Uh, you can down, download the 3.1, 1.2. Um, you can also get to the uh, Federal Highway Operations BCA Resources website, which has a, a variety of different information. In addition to the, the tools themselves, it has the manual, um, the desk reference, the compendiums that Jim mentioned, which show about you know 40 different uh, examples of benefit cost analyses done of uh, TISMO projects around the country, uh, some using TOP, some using other tools. Um, so th there's a lot of information there. And also, if you download uh, the presentations, which you're able to, the uh, links are included uh, in the presentations in a couple of places in Jim and my uh, slides. So there are, there are lots of ways to, uh, to get at it. We would, uh, and Jim, I think, would, would second this. We would uh, love to have anybody who uh, you know, has any spare time and, and uh, uh, wants to take a look at uh, 3.1 and um, give it a try with your own information, your own data. Uh, take a look at the manual. The, the uh, manual that's on the Federal Highway website um, uh, provides the basic methods for how to uh, enter and use TOPS. Uh, 3.0 has some modifications to it, uh, particularly in the cost side, uh, but the general rules still apply as how you move around in TOPS. Green cells require, uh, or, or uh, if there's a yellow cell next to a green cell, it means that there's a, the yellow cell is the default value and you can always override in the green cell uh, with a number. If there's no yellow cell and just a green, you have to put in a value. Um, but other than that, uh, uh, you know, TOPS is designed to be user-friendly, but it is, it is large and complex. And we, we find that uh, uh, the users tend to focus on just a few uh, technologies or strategies. They might be, you know, interested in, in ramp meters or just incident management or, you know, individual uh, uh, technologies or strategies. So the more people that we get to, to use it and try it out, um, and uh, identify what works for them, what uh, might not work for them, uh, or uh, where they have difficulties in getting the uh, tool to get to a conclusion and to find the benefit-cost ratio. Perhaps, uh, you know, feedback uh, would be great. Uh, you know, just like Microsoft likes to hear about uh, uh, where their operating system isn't working, we'd like to hear about uh, where TOPS PC might not be working for you. Um, and the only way we really get it tested is by folks, uh, you know, giving it a try and using it and giving us feedback on what's going on. I, Jim, I don't know, you want to say any more on that uh, topic? No, I would agree with, with everything you said, Mike. Uh, just one other quick quick point of, of, uh, of note, though, is that so we're, we're, uh, we weren't sure, you know, where we were going to, um, where the 3.1 was going to land, and we, we actually, you know, as, as a result of doing the workshops and webinars that Mike talked about, we uh, we have a list of, of enhancements that go beyond what we were able to accommodate in this next version. So 
the plan right now is to move right into um, a subsequent version, maybe a version 4, like a few months after this. So that FHWA website with the Top BC uh, tool on it now, you know, I would encourage you to um, just check back as well, you know, for the 3.1 final and the uh, and the likely 4.0 uh, soon after that in the near future. Thank you, Jim and Mike. Um, Jonathan, I see by your comment that you are not able to pull it from the file share box because of its size. Um, can you try and pull down the FHWA slides and see if you can access it via the link? If you're still having issues, go ahead and either shoot a message into the chat or reach out to Mike or Jim after the presentation. Um, another question, can you recommend good examples of life cycle cost analyses for transportation projects? Is there a centralized source of data to conduct that type of analysis? Does, do any of our speakers want to take on that question? Well, this is Mike. I, I think uh, Jim has mentioned uh, the ITS uh, database, um, the, the, the ITS cost database. That uh, is available on the Federal Highway uh, website. And actually, the, I believe there's a link to it uh, on the uh, operations information page that Jim mentioned. Um, the, uh, the advantage of that, and that, that's a tool that's been around for a while, maybe 10 years or so, maybe more, Jim. Um, but it, it sort of went dormant for a while um, from the 2012 to 2015 period, but now uh, Federal Highway has uh, put more resources into it. It's coming, it's being updated, and there's more and more information on it uh, all the time. It's being organized to be more user-friendly, um, and it, it provides, uh, it does provide a lot of information on life cycle costs for um, various technology. It's basically reporting uh, on uh, studies, papers, reports that have been produced uh, by academic institutions, by state DOTs, by MPOs, and by uh, others around the country and even around the world uh, on these technologies and how their uh, cost, the experience people are having with their costs over time. So a lot of that data is there. It just sort of depends on the particular technologies the, and strategies that you're interested in, whether the information will be substantial and helpful. But that's a good place to uh, start looking. Thank you. At this time, those are all the questions that we have received in the chat pod. Um, we have two minutes left if anybody wants to get typing. Otherwise, I will go ahead and hand it over to Jim for any final comments. Oh, thank you, Nicole. No, I just uh, want to appreciate, appreciate and show uh, thanks to especially to Stephanie and, um, and Matt. Uh, I know we didn't have any questions from Matt, but we are intent, we've had good support from our freight office, so I would encourage you to take a look at the latest version of, of the tool to see um, the four new freight strategies. It's certainly an area that we're kind of excited about, and um, I think Matt's presentation further uh, underlined the importance of this. So uh, I don't know, Tom, if you wanted to say anything, if you're on the line to relate to that or uh, yeah the only thing I would add Jim is it, it's just really really satisfying to see a lot of the freight technology investments and work that we've been doing over the years with regard to automated enforcement truck system automation investments to improve the truck parking situation seeing that moving over into the general population of uh, system operations and moving, uh, the, you know, the work that we had done previously into something like Tops BC, to me, it completes the package. It brings what is not traditionally normal activities when someone's doing an ITS program. However, it is really important work to protect the highways with effective enforcement, to protect our drivers' health with adequate parking facilities. It's, it's what really drives the economy. And I really, Jim, I really thank you for uh, inviting us in and helping us work with you on developing the freight elements. Thanks, Jim. All right, thank you. OK. Um, I guess we, we are uh, exactly at 3.30 PM Eastern time. Um, so if there's nothing else 
to be added uh, from our presenters here. I just want to thank everyone for attending this webinar. Uh, it was we really had some wonderful panelists and also some good information shared with us. Um, just a reminder again, I will send uh, I will uh, send a follow up email to you with the webinar recording and the slides. Um, so feel free to contact. Jim or uh, Mike, if you have any follow-up questions, and their contact information is in the uh, webinar slides. Um, we also will share again these uh, download uh, top BC uh, links in our uh, post-webinar uh, web page. Um, so I guess that is all uh, we have for today. And on behalf of National Operations Center of Excellence and our presenters, I uh, re really want to thank you and wish you a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.